Hey animal enthusiasts and fellow herpetologists, Mr. Well here, and today I'm going to show you a few different ways to tell if a lizard is male or female in some common lizard families. Let's get into it. I was recently requested to go over how to tell if a side blotch lizard is male or female, so in this video, I will show you a simple way to determine the sex of them with a minimally invasive technique. I thought this would also be a perfect opportunity to talk about other lizards as a whole, since this trick doesn't apply for all squamates. I first want to do a quick biology refresher. Squamates include all lizards and snakes, and while snakes are often categorized differently, I'll still go over them briefly, since phylogenetically speaking, snakes are lizards, and not including them would make their grouping paraphyletic. Snakes are actually just a clade embedded within the lizard phylogenetic tree. For much of these reptiles, sexing them can be tricky, with sexual dimorphism being rare or subtle, especially with snakes. But for others, there are some key traits to look for. First things first, let's go over the side blotch lizard. These lizards are in family Phrynosomatidae, which is also referred to as the North American spiny lizards. The simplest trick to determine if a lizard in his family is male or female is by looking at their underside past the pelvic region. Males will have a set of enlarged postanal scales, which are absent in the females. In smaller lizards and juveniles, it may be more difficult to see, so I would recommend using a magnifying glass. Males of this species, Uta stansburiana, also tend to be much more colorful than the females, with three throat color morphs of blue, orange, or yellow. Researchers have found that these colors give them a rock-paper-scissors game as a breeding strategy since each color has an advantage over one other color, but not over both the other colors. Upon first glance, I would not immediately identify a side blotch lizard as a male just because it has a bright throw color, since females have also been found to have bright throw coloration. Instead, look for those enlarged postanal scales. Another friend is somatid where this is especially true are fence lizards, in genus Scalopris. In some areas, females can be just as bright and colorful as the males with their blue bellies, but looking for those enlarged postanal scales can help us distinguish whether it is male or female. Other frequently seen phrenosomatids where you can use this trick include horned lizards, fringed toad lizards, long-tailed brush lizards, and any other lizard in genus Scalopris, such as sagebrush lizards, desert spiny lizards, and granite spiny lizards. Other lizards in this family found in the pet hobby where this method can be applied to include emerald swifts, which are also genus Scalopris, zebra-tailed lizards, and earless lizards. Interestingly, some animals in family Dactyloidae can also be sexed with this method. This includes the green animal, which is also commonly seen in the pet hobby. Getting a detailed close-up view of the underside below the cloaca will allow you to see if there are enlarged postanal scales, if it's a male. If there are none, then it's a female. Other characteristics of a male green animal is the extensible pinkish dewlap. Females rarely will have a dewlap and they tend to be much smaller. Similarly, in family Teidae, certain species of whiptails could also be identified as male or female by the presence or absence of a postanal plate. This was studied in former genus Nemidophorus, which is now classified as a Speedocellus. All males possess postanal plates while females do not. On the other hand, some whiptails in the same genus don't even require sexual dimorphism to be sex since all individuals are actually females. The New Mexico whiptail is a good example of this. These lizards reproduce asexually through a process known as parthenogenesis. Here, their eggs develop into embryos without the need of fertilization from a male. Similarly, in family Caconidae, Morning geckos are also an all-female species that reproduce via parthenogenesis. Most other geckos in this family have very subtle dimorphism. For example, in toke geckos, males tend to be slightly larger than females with a larger head and more prominent femoral pores. Specifically in this species, although both males and females are vocal, males are more likely to call out repeatedly. On the other hand, in day geckos, females are slightly duller in color than males. In the electric blue day gecko, males tend to be a rich, vibrant shade of blue, while females are a more subtle shade of green. In family Diplodactylidae, dimorphism tends to be similar to those in Gekonidae. An example in this family are crested geckos. Here, 
Males will have a more prominent hemipenal bulge past the vent, while it is flat in females. This can be seen in gargoyle geckos as well. However, it is best to tell once the animal is around 5-7 to seven months of age. Leopard geckos and family Ubliferidae are similar in that males tend to have a larger hemipenal bulge, along with much more prominent femoral pores. In the related species western banded gecko, males can be distinguished by having spurs at the base of the tail, while females do not. I want to give a quick refresher for some of these terms just in case you don't know what I'm talking about. Hemipenes are the paired, intromittent organs found in male lizards and snakes located at the base of the tail and are used alternately during mating. Femoral pores, on the other hand, are part of the holocrine gland that produces a waxy secretion which contain pheromones to attract mates or mark territory. These are found on the underside of the thighs for certain lizards. In family Agamidae, the most commonly kept lizard is the bearded dragon. Like some of the previously mentioned lizards, males can be distinguished by having two hemipenal bulges on each side of the tail base and much more prominent femoral pores than in females. Meanwhile, in the Euromastix, Males tend to be larger than females for most species, and are much more brightly colored. Males will also have a more prominent hemipenal bulge and femoral pores. For many lizards, identifying hemipenal bulges can be challenging, especially in younger individuals. A minimally invasive technique known as hemipenal transillumination, termed by Danny Brown, offers a more accurate method for sexing lizards. In this technique, the lizard is placed on its back with its tail directed toward the handler. Then, a bright focused and non-heat producing light source is positioned behind the base of the tail. The light shines through the tail, making internal structures such as the hemipenes more visible. Danny Brown originally used this method to sex varanids, which are the monitor lizards, but it has also been proven effective for other families as well, including Xanthusiidae, which are the night lizards, Agamidae, Gaconidae, and Skinkidae, which are the skinks. It can also be used in both juveniles and adults, However, special care should be taken with species capable of caudal autotomy to minimize stress and prevent unintended tail loss. For much of the remaining lizard families, distinguishing between males and females follows a similar pattern. Males are often slightly larger, have bigger heads, or display more vibrant coloration, with sexual dimorphism being mostly species-specific. An example is in family Anguidae. In the southern alligator lizard, males tend to have a broader, more triangular head. This may have to do with their courtship behavior of males holding onto the head of females. Looking at the vent region for these lizards provides no support in determining if it is male or female. Similarly, in family Helodermatidae, male Gila monsters also have a more triangular head compared to females, while tail length and body size don't differ significantly. In family Crotophytidae, male Great Basin collared lizards also have a broader head than females. On the underside, the black collar band extends down the throat, covering much of the neck and chin. Additionally, males have two distinct black patches near the vent region. Interestingly, in the long-nosed leopard lizard, females are actually larger than males. During the breeding season, females will develop dark reddish-orange spots and bars along their sides and beneath the tail. Males, on the other hand, do not develop this reddish pigmentation and instead occasionally will exhibit a lighter pinkish coloration. Moving on to Corytophanidae, a famous lizard here is the common basilisk lizard. Here, males are larger than females and process much more prominent crests on the head, back, and tail. In family Iguanidae, male green iguanas are typically larger than females with much larger extendable dewlaps. Finally, in family Chameleonidae, one of the most famously known examples of sexual dimorphism occurs in the Jackson's chameleon. Here, Males have a set of three horns which are used to assert dominance. These are absent in the female or only a remnant of a rostral horn can be seen. In wild chameleons, males have a much more prominent helmet compared to females, along with a protruding spur on the hind foot. In panther chameleons, males are much brighter in coloration than females and tend to have a broken white stripe going down the length of the body. Females tend to be a much duller shade of pale green, tan, or gray. So that concludes our look at the fascinating differences between male and female lizards across some of the more commonly seen lizard families. From subtle size differences and head shapes, to bold coloration and unique markings, it's clear that sexing lizards isn't always straightforward, but some non-invasive techniques can help us gain a better understanding of whether we have a male or female. When it comes to keeping a lizard as a companion, there's not really a difference in the amount or type of care for the animal, regardless if it's a male or female. 
but making sure you can provide proper husbandry and care requirements can reduce the risk of complications such as egg binding in females for certain species. Unfortunately, this video doesn't include all lizard families, such as those in suborder Amphisbania, but hopefully one day I will have greater knowledge on these lesser known groups. If you found this video helpful, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more reptile content. If you have questions or want me to cover a specific species in the future, let me know in the comments, and stay tuned for part B, where I'll hopefully go over some common snake families. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!